analog output just reached 100 subscribers. So to celebrate, I'm going to push this button 100 times. Hey, welcome to Analog Output. This time we are looking at a module that I call Gate Grinder. And yes, I do get to decide what it's called because it's a module that I designed. When I say designed, to some extent I mean cut and pasted, you know, found a bit from this circuit and a bit from that circuit that I thought might work together and a bit from that other circuit kind of glued them together and got it working. Uh, I was actually quite flabbergasted when I went and breadboarded the circuit and found that it basically entirely worked the way I wanted it to and even more flabbergasted when I built the module and it worked the first time without having to fix anything. It was quite a remarkable thing. Um, it is, as I said, not much originality in there. There's lots of bits and pieces that are lifted from other circuits, but even so, I think it counts as probably the most ambitious piece of electronic designing I've ever done uh, by quite a margin, and it came out great. So let's take a look at it. Uh, what's this thing do? I sorted the elevator pitch as well. It is a module, it's a utility module for generating and transforming gates and triggers and clocks. Okay, how about the details? Well, let's take a look at a block diagram. So there are three kinds of signals that this thing deals with, three, three origins of signals. One of them you saw at the beginning there, there's a push button. When you push the button, it generates a gate. You push the button, the gate comes on. You let go of the button, the gate comes off. So that's one of them. And another one is there is an input where you can put gate signals or trigger signals or a clock signal. And then there is a third signal source, which is there is an internal clock generator in the module, and uh, the rate of this clock is controlled by a switch on the front panel that lets you select between two frequency ranges, and then there's a knob that lets you tune in within that frequency range. Between the two, it covers a range from about 0.14 hertz up to about 320 hertz. So those are sort of our three signal sources, and the three of them all get put together in an OR circuit. The clock goes through a switch, so you can decide whether you want the, the clock to be going into the OR or not. And the output of the OR is just, it's just the logical OR of what went in there. So if you could, in principle, be using, you know, pushing the button and inputting gates and running the clock all at the same time, and it'll just do the OR of the three of them. More realistically, you'd probably just be using one of the three at a time, but if you want to use more than one, you can. So the output of the OR, what happens to that? Well, it goes to two places. One of them is a switch, which we'll talk more about later on. And the other thing is it goes to a piece of circuitry which converts gates to pulses. So if you have a, a long gate in that um, signal source, it goes into there and what comes out is a short pulse at the leading edge of the gate. And that pulse then triggers an internal one-shot circuit, which generates a gate of a particular width. And you control that width again with a 
range switch and a knob on the front panel covering a range from about three milliseconds up to about five seconds for the width of that gate. And then the output of that one shot also goes to that same switch. So the switch is used to select which of these things you're going to use for your outputs. Are you going to use the OR of the raw gates coming in or are you going to use the output of the one shot which you know produces a gate whenever there was a gate coming in but the gate that it produces is a fixed width under your control as opposed to the, the width of the incoming gate. So you have a switch to select one or the other of those and it gets sent to the outputs. So one thing is that these signals get sent directly to an output that's labeled out originally enough. Uh, it's also sent to another gate to pulse circuit which again produces a pulse, a short pulse at the leading edge of any gates that it sees and those short trigger pulses uh, appear on the output labeled on indicating this is a, a trigger indicating when the gate comes on. So those are your two outputs but wait there's more. There's another place this stuff is sent to and that is an inverter. So the output of the inverter is just the opposite of what you put into it. You have a gate that's on, the inverter is off. Uh, the inverter output, if you put it, uh, if you have the gate off, then the inverter output is on. So it uh, gives you the opposite of the gate and then that goes through the same kind of circuitry as the original gate did. So the inverted gate goes to the inverted gate output jack and the inverted gate also goes to yet another gate to pulse circuit which produces a pulse uh, at the leading edge of the inverted gate which if you stop and think about it that's the trailing edge of the original signal. So what you get on the outputs is you get the original signal which may or may not have had its length uh, redefined uh, by the the circuitry in the middle there. You get a trigger when that gate comes on, you get a trigger when that gate turns off, and you get the inverted gate. Okay, fine. Why? What would you do with all this? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. You can produce inverted gates. You can put a gate in and look at one of the trigger outputs. You're converting gates to triggers. On the other hand, you could put a trigger in and turn on the resizing circuitry in the middle, set it to whatever width you want, and now you're converting triggers to gates. Or you can put a gate in of arbitrary width and convert it to a gate of your chosen width. So you can change the width, widths of gates. You can turn on the clock. You've got a clock generator. Uh, if you just look directly at the clock generator it's about 50 percent duty cycle on and off equally but if you send it through the resizing circuitry again you can make the duty cycle of that clock as long or as short as you want it to be or you can look at the trigger outputs and then you've got a trigger clock as opposed to a gate clock so there's lots and lots of stuff you can do with this i'll give you a demonstration of some of this stuff Okay, there are two LEDs, a green one and a red one. Green one is on when the gate is on. Red one is on when the inverse gate is on. So the red one's on whenever the green one's off and vice versa. You've seen how the push button works. If I hold it down, I get a longer gate. Or if I turn on the resize, the gate length doesn't depend on how long I hold it down. Again, uh, turn this up to a wider width and get a nice long gate. Uh, turn it way down, get a nice short one. Okay, uh, I can, let's see, we'll turn off the resize, turn on the clock. Let's turn 
turn down the speed there. So this is like a 50% duty cycle clock and it can go very low. Or it can go really high. Okay. Or we can use a narrow gate. clock with a very short duty cycle. Or, you know, a very long duty cycle. If we go into the inverse output, we've got a gate that stays on until I push the button. Turn off the resize. Okay, one other thing I've done here is I've put another cable in on the off trigger. So it gets a trigger when the gate turns off, and that's triggering an envelope generator on another oscillator. So when I push the button, I get the same sound as before, but when I release it, I get an, a sound from another oscillator through another envelope generator. So. <laughs> Okay, so that was a kind of a simple demonstration of some of the basic capabilities of that thing. Um, I think you can probably see how you could uh, use it for some more complicated patches with some really interesting results. If you would like to make a gate grinder of your own, the uh, link to the GitHub repository is down there in the description. And there's a KiCad format schematics and uh, PC board layout and Gerber files for uploading to get a PC board manufactured for you. Um, is, this is a uh, Cosmo format, uh, 20 centimeters by 10. If you want to do Eurorack format, there's it's the the electrically it's fine for Eurorack, no modifications needed, but you would have to rework the printed circuit board to fit within the smaller height of Eurorack. Uh, not terribly difficult, I'm sure, but you know, requires some effort. If you do do that, or if you come up with any other interesting modifications, this is open source hardware, do what you like with it, but I'd be really interested in hearing what you come up with. And to the first 100 sub... hang on. First 104 subscribers, welcome, thank you, and uh, if you're not one of those 104 subscribers, well, the, the, over there, um, subscribe button, hit the, hit the subscribe button, and uh, there's lots more coming up. You can probably see something kind of uh, tantalizing back there, and over there, there's a new, uh, LMNC module that I just built, and over there there's a uh, a breadboard with some interesting stuff on it, and, uh, and this stuff all just showed up in the in the mail the other day. Thank you, Corey, and um, yeah, fun's just getting started here. So subscribe, hit the like button, and tune in next time. I will see you again on Analog Output.